Well, we have some experiments going on because I work at the Institute for Creation Research, and guess what we do there? Research. 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 And so one of the experiments that we're running is uh, on mosquitoes. And so we have these uh, cages with mosquitoes that we're raising, and we have some predictions that we're, that we're making based on the creation model. You know, because when my wife and I go backpacking and she gets eaten by mosquitoes, what does she say every time? Why did God make mosquitoes? But the assumption in that question is that God made mosquitoes the way they are today. They may have changed in the interim. So creatures have made certain changes. They're trying to get along in this fallen world. Mosquitoes are trying to get along in this fallen world. So I tried to explain to her, there's 130 different mosquito species, and of all those, only three of them take blood meals. Most mosquitoes take meals from plant nectar. So the three that take blood um, ha are trying to find some way to get the nutrients that they need when there's no plant nectar available. So we tested that hypothesis, and uh, so our guinea pig is Scott, my good buddy Scott, and he sticks his arm in the mosquito, and a hundred different mosquitoes take blood meals, and he just goes, well, because he's southern, he goes, well, it feels kind of funny at first, you know, and so he lets them all get their blood meals, and then all the female needs is one good big blood meal, and that gives her enough nutrients to produce her clutch of eggs, then they lay their eggs, and then we harvest the eggs, and we uh, grow up the next generation, etc. Well, what genius Scott did was he decided, let's give these um, Anopheles, these blood-sucking mosquitoes, a nectar substitute based on the idea that they still retain their originally created preference for some kind of not-blood, plant-based meal. And we took our nectar, and we put it in a dish, and we put it in... Um, the cage at feeding time at the same time as Scott sliding in his arm and all 100 mosquitoes go to the dish. Not one of them goes to his arm. I don't have a picture of it yet because we want to publish it and get it peer reviewed in the journals first, but this is right at the leading edge you guys are getting tonight of our experiment. And so, wow, can you imagine a backyard party? Well, you guys don't have much problem with it here in Arizona, I don't imagine. But I'm sure there are some mosquitoes because they're kind of like everywhere. But uh, they're a big problem in Dallas and a lot of places, certainly. And you just put a dish of nectar out, you know, plant-based something. And uh, maybe we can sell it. And that's how ICR can make lots of money so that we can do more research. <laughs> anyway, uh, here's your backyard party and you put this dish out and all the mosquitoes will jump off the people at your party and into the dish and everyone's happy. Maybe that's what will happen one day. Uh, meanwhile, we're trying to figure out what's going on with these mosquitoes. Well, just by way of introduction, we're trying to ask and answer these kinds of questions. Here's a big question that this experiment um, helps answer. The mosquitoes that we obtain for this experiment have been raised in evolutionary labs um, by secular scientists um, for 30 years, so we're talking hundreds of generations, and every one of those generations has had one type of meal. What was it? Blood meal, blood meal, blood meal. So some lab rat, some graduate student, stuck his arm in every single time they needed to supply these mosquitoes with food. And uh, so 30 years, hundreds of generations, you'd think maybe... If the, if the traditional story that we're told about how creatures adapt by, by eons of death of the unfit or death of the less fit or whatever story you want to tell, you'd think that by, by some point, maybe by now, these mosquitoes would have adapted to um, a new life on blood and they would have lost their ability and their affinity for the, for the older generations. Um, but that's not the case. In fact, not at all. So these are exciting new times and exciting new results showing that these mosquitoes, even though they do take our blood today, it's only when they are desperate and they're desperately thirsty. They get extremely thirsty, and that's the only time that they'll go for you and take your blood. Uh, so, so this begins uh, a series of questions that we want to try to answer. Um, and oh, there's a mosquito in its normal habitat taking its preferred um, 
food source. How do creatures adapt? Do they adapt by eons, many generations, of the ones that don't survive die off, and the, only, the ones that do survive, they're the ones that adapt. Is that how it works? Or does adaptation work um, differently? So we have a new model based on engineering. If you're going to engineer a creature to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, what capabilities would you engineer into that creature for it to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth? Fill the earth's ever-changing environment. You might, for example, give that creature... Um, uh, detectors so it could detect its environment it could detect all the factors that are relevant to its ability to multiply and fill and then you might equip that creature with internal processes that know what to do with the data that it's detecting and then you might out outfit that creature with targeted responses in other words an ability to adjust itself not the environment do the adjusting but it's adjusting itself that's what we do with engineering. That's how you, um, that's how you do, uh, 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 let's see, what about these drones? Like, a, a, like a, an autopilot on an airplane. Press the autopilot button. What happens? Well, there's detectors that detect wind speed, altitude, and there's, um, it, it's got radio on it, so it can detect that there's a mountain ahead. That would be important information if there's a big mountain ahead. And if it detects a mountain, then it's got an internal process that says, ah, obstacle ahead. And then it has an appropriate response. You better change the angle of the wings and increase the thrust so you can go over the mountain. All those are internal to the designed, engineered um, airplane. And we are looking for these same kind of uh, features in creatures. And uh, so these, these uh, when, when the airplane flies over, uh, the mountain, then there's no longer a mountain, then it goes back to its normal altitude. And then if another mountain comes up, it's going to do the same set of processes, so therefore it's repeatable. Do we see creatures repeating the same adaptation when they're faced with the same environmental challenges? And that's what we're looking for. So we're going to look at seven different creatures tonight in the next, the next 30 or so minutes. And uh, by looking at these seven different creatures, the way they react, the way they adapt, uh, we're going to look for detectors, internal processes, um, targeted responses, sensible responses, not random, and repeatability. If we find one, two, three, or all four of these features, then we'll be able to conclude that at least with these seven creatures, their adaptations are occurring not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Make sense? Creature number one, the famous icon of evolution that everyone has to learn when they go to biology class, the peppered moth, Distan betularia. So there's the peppered moth, and here's this, the typical story. By the way, there's um, many different species of peppered moths. This is the one that the, the iconic story, uh, classic uh, study was done. Um, in the early uh, mid, well, they're still studying this thing. So the story went like this, during the Industrial Revolution, before the Industrial Revolution, the peppered moth was mostly white with pepper flakes on it, bits of melanin, dark coloring, and it would blend in to the background of the tree bark. And then when the Industrial Revolution came, so that way, when birds flew by, they just saw tree bark, they didn't see the peppered moth, because it's camouflage. Then the Industrial Revolution came along, and they're, ex and they're pushing out a bunch of uh, black smoke and exhaust, which sticks to the tree trunk, which did happen. Now the birds can see the white, the mostly white um, a moth, pick them off, and the only ones that survive. So it's lots and lots of death and dying moths. The only moths that survived, according to the story, were the ones that happened to, um, to have mostly black with tiny white flecks. And so the dark ones survived. Well, that's the story. And so it's something like, something like this. The, the, the birds can see the one, and the birds can't see the other. And so the birds are doing the engineering in this model. It's the outside force that, that is so, supposedly making this change, making this creature adapt. Well, one problem with that study is that uh, the peppered moths don't even rest on tree trunks. They live on the underside of leaves, and they're nocturnal. So birds are at rest during that time anyways. Um, 
So those are two issues. But there's an even bigger issue, and that is that the, those silly scientists, those geneticists, they're getting involved. And by the way, before the Industrial Revolution, we had a portion of the population that was mostly light, but there's some that were already dark. And then after the Industrial Revolution, we still have some that are light and some that are dark. The ratio may have changed of how many you have that are light, how many that you have that are dark, but we're still trying to figure out what changed that ratio. But the question we're asking is, how did the ratio change? And it turns out that just a few years ago, researchers conducted a study they published in biology letters. Uh, get this. So there's a, there's a, there's a genetic um, switching mechanism called a transposable element. Do you want to say it just to make it like, I don't know, just say it for me. Transposable, transposable element. element. So it transposes from one position in the genome to another. Well, it turns out that 103 out of 105 of the test moths had the same transposable element copied from one place in the genome and then uh, pasted into the exact same place in all the different genomes. And it produced the exact same effect, which was uh, to change the, uh, the pigment pattern of the moths. In other words, it wasn't the birds at all. The birds had nothing to do with it. There was no predator involved at all. After all these years, my biology teacher told me the wrong thing. Phooey. She should have been talking about transposable elements. I had a wonderful lady biology teacher, but she was trying her best. Uh, and so now, but now we know. And so in other words, it's not external. It turns out to be internal. And the moths are detecting something and they're making an appropriate output so they can blend in with their environment by turning off and on a specific genetic switch. In this case, it's a transposable element, but there's lots of different genetic switches. So it turns out it's internal, not external, which matches our model's prediction based on the creation idea that God made these creatures to do what? Adapt, well, reproduce, fill the earth, fill the earth's ever-changing environment. So as the generations pass, the next generation of moth might encounter a dark environment, and it needs to deploy a dark version of itself, or a light environment, and it needs to deploy the light version of itself. And so now, suddenly, the, the, um, the center of attention shifts from nature to the creator, because who else but the creator could have engineered these creatures with internal capabilities to turn off and on genetic switches at the right time for the right reason to produce just the right effect. Well, number two, stick spider, the Hawaiian stick spider. Ariamnes, it's a tiny and it doesn't spin a web and it also is nocturnal, which is probably why I wasn't able to find it on Maui when I went hunting for the stick spider. Anyway, we got cute pictures of me looking under leaves for the stick spider that I never found, uh, but I'm trying, you know. I, uh, because I wanted to see it firsthand, but I can't yet. I'll, I'll go again this fall because my daughter lives on Maui, so that's, it's a real shame, you know, to do research. <laughs> I have to suffer for the Lord sometimes, you know. And I'll go back, and maybe I'll bring a flashlight and look for some more Ariamne. So, but these Hawaiian stick spiders, you know, the Hawaiian island chain is lined up there. And um, these, these spiders pioneer the island, and they have historically hopped from one, one island to the next. And it turns out that um, they produce variations. So some of these are uh, red, some are white, some are gold, some are black. And they have different body shapes. But of all these different variations, the red, white, gold, and black, on one island, look just, the red one on this island looks just like the red one on that island. And the gold one on this island looks just like the gold one on that island. And you'd think it would be four different species because they're completely different body color sometimes. And habits. Like the white ones live on the lichen, which is colored white. The black ones live under leaves, hiding in the dark. The red ones live in the red leaves, fallen leaves on the, on the forest floor, etc. So they know where to live. But it turns out they're not different species because scientists have um, uh, sequenced and compared the DNA and they found that these are genetically uh, very close. In other words, they're brothers and sisters. So in one, uh, in one uh, and very, very rapidly, they've pioneered these islands. So here we have some on Maui, some on Kauai, 
them on um, Oahu and the different Hawaiian islands. And you can have a black, one black spider pioneers one island, and from that one black spider, in, in who knows how many generations, we still need to figure it out, but in a short number of generations, maybe it's just one. Who knows? No one's, no, this, is, this is why we do science. We want to find out. Is it just going to be in one generation? Suddenly you have babies that are gold, white. It's a, it's, so it, maybe it's six generations. Who knows what? So, but what we do see is that these adaptations are occurring according to a repeatable plan. Because every time they hop to a new island, they deploy, they, they're like a Swiss Army spider. They deploy, you know, the Swiss Army knife. You can flip out this tool or the blade or the, the saw or the what. It's like every generation. It can deploy the gold version or the black version or the red version in any, gen, in any given generation. And then it switches back. And every time you pioneer a new island, you can deploy the same set of options. Predetermined genetic uh, uh, phenotypic options. So anyway, it's repeatable. So that fits our model of, of design uh, and transfers the credit. And by the way, you don't have to have um, lizards eating all the gold ones because these things, they're all coexisting in different parts of the same, fo uh, same forest. So you don't even have to have any death. By the way, that's a key principle that Charles Darwin described in his big famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection or preservation of favored races and the struggle for life. He said it's all a struggle for life and it's the struggle and you're trying to avoid death. And so eons of death, that's how you produce creature change. That's how creatures adapt. By If you don't adapt, you die. That's how it happens. That's what I was taught and told. Uh, now we're finding out that uh, these creatures have internal capabilities pre-designed and engineered and repeatable. And what about these blind cave fish? Uh, ask the NX. We have I don't know how many it's aquaria it's tucked in our lab. Our lab is full of aquaria, and we've got blind cavefish, sighted cavefish. They're interfertile. They look really different. You can see the ones on the top. Do you see them there? With eyes and pigment and, and, and um, the ones on the bottom, no eyes, no pigment. Well, the story that I was told and that I used to teach others, even while I worked at the Institute. I started here in 2008. By the way, we're over 50 years old. We've been doing creation research, answering these kinds of questions. Well, we're ready to, to revolutionize the whole way we think about biology uh, because I was taught that um, the way you go from sighted to blind is a generation of sighted cavefish living on the surface started to get close to an underground waterway, and, and uh, there's a passageway that connects to a cave. Uh, and there's about six different systems that have this, this feature in uh, Mexico and other places. There's some in Texas, too. But anyway, the Mexican blind um, tetra. And uh, so, oh, and he's down there and he can't see, but he's got these big old eyes. And so he bumps his eye against the side of the cave and he scrapes his eye and then he gets an infection and he dies. So, well, he didn't adapt. He failed. But then he, ha he happened to have kids with smaller eyes that were less able to get scratched and, and die of infection. That's the story I used to teach, that it was the death of the unfit that produces the next generation of adaptive, better adapted creatures. Well, that story is proving to be not true at all. Secular researchers are really cranking out tons of results from all their experiments on the blind cavefish, and we're joining them. So here we have cute little fish uh, in their eggs, and a, a, a research group published in the journal Science not long ago, their results of... Uh, uh, what they found was on the, in the, on the egg shell, these are tiny eggs. I mean, you could barely see them. But on the egg shell, by the way, we have billions of these eggs. They keep growing and making new fish. But um, So if you want to buy us an aquarium, they're like $100. We accept. We just need a lab to put them in. So, we, if, By the way, if, you, if you'd like to buy us a lab, <laughs> we just need a million dollars for the $100 aquariums to go in. We accept. So anyway, on the surface, they found on the surface, uh, embedded in the egg, in the egg shell, it's a soft shell, but um, there are little uh, detectors, and they're detecting um, electrical conductivity. So they're little conductivity detectors. Uh, they're made of protein. They're embedded in the egg. And so that uh, is a measure of um, ions, the, the concentration of ions affects conductivity in water. And it turns out that... Um, 
in the caves, it's, it's um, the conductivity is uh, um, different than what it is in the surface, a lot lower in the caves. And so that, that um, information was transferred down to all the cells in the developing em embryo, um, uh, and then the embryo's cells had pre-programmed um, responses and knew what to do with those data. And what did they do? They produced reduced eyes and smaller eye sockets. So we just think in a few more generations of those same types of exposures, maybe we can get these eyeballs to turn off. That's what we're working on now. Well, we're reading the literature, and the literature says, and every time it's in the introduction to their paper. Introduction. The blind cave fish is a model organism for creature adaptations showing evolution. And then it says, these, ev these evolutionary changes have gone from sighted to blind multiple times the same way, and it has taken two million years. And they repeat that from like the last paper who said it. And that paper repeated from the guy, who, they read it from someone else's paper. They just cite someone else's paper, um, and then they're done. They don't examine it. Um, we're, we are, I'm, I'm just going to tell you a secret. Th is this live casted or is this being broadcast? Because if it is, I can't tell the secret. You'll have to ask me afterwards. Okay. I'll just put it this way. We're finding adaptations um, that involve pigmentation and eyes. Uh, we're finding that these adaptations happen in our lifetime, easily in our lifetime. Not millions of years, not hundreds of thousands of years, not thousands of years, not tens of years. We just started last year, and we're already seeing these things. So rapid, repeatable, internal detectors. They do have detectors. These eggs do have conductivity detectors. Who put those there? Who put those detectors in there so that the fish would know, even while they're still developing in the egg, they're getting information about what the world's going to be like when they enter it and what they, for their, they need to deploy in order to best fit that, um, that particular environment. Well, we've done three. We've got four to go. Having fun yet? Okay. Some of you look like you're having fun. I appreciate it. You know, it's these people in the back who are like, I'm not having any fun. But fortunately... You know what's fun is I get these people, and then afterward, this guy comes up to me. I'm like, oh, no, here it comes. It's the guy that had his full arms crossed. And he goes, I so appreciate what you said. I'm like, oh, you weren't the guy I thought you were. That's great. Okay. Anyway, it helps me when you smile. I appreciate you smiling. But, so we're, we're looking at the, the three-spine stickleback. Uh, we don't have aquariums with these yet. But if you want to buy us a lab, uh, we're, we're, we're willing to look at it. This is an amazing creature, um, three-spined stickleback fish. It's in the ocean, and the ocean version is different than the lake and stream freshwater version. Two different versions. They look really different. Um, I think I have a picture of them. Mm, this, is, this is one of them. This is their, this freshwater version. Anyway, they pioneer the freshwater from the ocean. They swim up the stream, and then they spawn, and then they have a new generation in the freshwater that looks very different from the parent. And then another generation looks different from them. And so it turns out that uh, the ocean version has bony armor plates on its side. It has three big spines in its back. It's a bigger body. And the freshwater version has just a small bone on its side, less armor plating. And it, and it has much smaller and, and uh, fewer spines on its back. Okay? Because uh, conditions in the ocean are really rougher. There's more predators there. And uh, they actually detect bits of, of chewed up cousins as they're developing. And, and even as adults, they can some fish detect bits of chewed up cousins and brothers, and they immediately deploy uh, changes uh, to, uh, to better fit that environment where their buddies are getting eaten. Uh, but in the freshwater environment, they're not getting eaten as much, and they, they, don't, have to, they don't have to put so many resources into producing armor and, and spikes. They can just produce another generation. Uh, and so anyway, that's, but how does it happen? How do three-spine sticklebacks adapt? Does it happen by gobs and gobs of death of the unfit or of the geneticists getting involved? Yes, the geneticists, oh, the scientists who keep telling us what's going on. Well, this one research group found that there's a genetic switch that's happening in the stickleback. I'm going to see if I can read it um, on the screen here. Reuse of the... Uh, EVA gene provided the initial evidence to our team 
that the repeated, what's that word? Repeated. It's repeatable. Maybe it was put there on purpose. Maybe that's what, you know, like the plane that repeats the same process as it detects the mountain ahead of it. And these fish are repeating the same process, maybe because they have detectors. Hey, we're now in freshwater. Hey, there's no more predators. Repeatability is a mark, as a hallmark of design, is what we're suggesting. Repeated evolution, and we'll scratch that word out. It's the repeated change. It's the repeated adaptation, not necessarily evolution. Anyway, of freshwater phenotypic traits. That's, you know, fresh, freshwater traits. You know, anyway, that was the result of, get this, standing genetic variation that exists rather than a bunch of new mutations. So what is standing genetic variation? Well, it's genetic, it's variation. In other words, it's like Swiss Army genes. You can deploy this gene, or you can open a different volume of instruction code in another gene and, and use that instruction code instead. And it's already in there. The encyclopedia is standing in the creature already. So these are evolutionary scientists admitting that standing, pre-existing genetic information is already in the fish, and that's what tells these fish to deploy the same set of traits whenever it pioneers freshwater, whether it's in Scotland, whether it's in uh, uh, Canada, or, or Oregon, or wherever these are pioneering these freshwater environments, and it's happening in our lifetime. And we can test these things, and we can subject these fish to different... Um, let me show you a picture. So there's the... the an x-ray of the spiny one on top and then the freshwater one on the bottom, the, the marine one on the top and the freshwater one on the bottom. Another study showed this. We showed that repeated exposure to cues of a predator. They're called alarm pheromones. What are they? Chopped up bits of cousin. Now, by the way, if you're a bat and you have a chopped up bit of a spiny stickleback and it bumps into your detectors, do you care about that? Well, no, because you're a bat. You eat these things. It only is a, it's only an important factor to the stickleback, which is why it has detectors that are specifically designed to detect bits of its own kind of chemical from its own species or kind. Okay. Anyway, the results in significant differential expression of genes involved in immune response, synaptic processes, brain metab metabolic processes, and visual perception. In other words, the whole nervous system gets reshaped whenever it detects cues of its cousins getting eaten. So that's detectors, internal processes, and appropriate responses uh, happening in this spiny, three spine stickleback. Uh, well, that's really cool. It's happening fast, and it's happening internally because of pre designed standing genetic variation. Well, the ground fish is, finch is really. Um, is, is really an icon of evolution. I was at a um, my son's wedding reception. You know, we had five kids in four years. Twins. Um, one set of twins. And then they all grew up and went to college and got married. And we had four weddings in 15 months. One of them didn't get married, and we told her, you are not allowed to date. No more weddings. Um, just kidding. Not kidding. Uh, it's a lot of weddings. Well, we went to a wedding reception for my son. Uh, four girls, one boy. And um, he, had, he had a friend there, and we just got to chatting. What do you do for a living? I love that question. Well, I'm a scientist. I work for the Institute for Creation Research. You what? You believe the Bible and you do science? I thought that was not possible. That's a lot of the reaction I get. Well, here I am. <laughs> You know, have you, have you heard of Sir Isaac Newton? He was like me, you know, Kepler, the science who believed the Bible. We kind of invented science, but anyway, uh, I digress. It's so, it's so, uh, so she, she just said, wait, you don't believe ev evolution? I was like, well, I, I believe the Bible, and there's no evolution there, and I don't see evolution happening in the real world with creatures. And she said, have you ever been to the Galapagos? So she's trying to be real nice and gentle, and basically she's saying, don't you know that the proof of evolution is in the Galapagos with the, with, with, uh, with the, with the ground finch? And um, I said, I wish we could talk about the finch, because I want to tell you what I'm about to show you guys right now. 
but it wasn't the right time for it. I hadn't physically been there, ma'am, but you want to talk about the finch? Let's do it. Oh, let me go get another drink. Hadn't seen her since. <laughs> so anyway, he was speechless. So there's, uh, so how do these, what do these creatures do to adapt? By the way, the evolutionary story needs to take a non-bird with no beak and no feathers and turn it into a bird with beak and feathers. Do we see that happening in the fossils? No. Do we see it happening today? No. If it's a bird, it's got the beak, it's got the feathers, it has all the equipment that it needs. But it even has an additional set of equipment. It has equipment that adjusts its equipment. It has internal programming. Well, I thought it was external. I thought that in seasons of drought, the bird goes from long beak to short beak. Because in drought, all it can eat is seeds. So the ones with the long beak can't access can't, it doesn't have the strength to crunch through those tough seeds, so it dies. So we have generations of dying birds, and that's why it adapts. It's because of lots of death of the unfit. That's a Darwinian perspective, and I'm ready to get rid of it because we're finding over and over again that it doesn't explain what's actually happening in the real world with the real birds or other creatures. Um, anyway, that's the story. Is um, The bird, in seasons of drought, changes the shape of its beak, Changes the shape, and then it shifts back to a long beak during wet seasons when it's got seeds that are soft. Okay, that's a cute story, and it's really simple, and it, it seems to explain what we see. Um, except that now the geneticists got involved, and they did research, and they tried to figure out the genes that are involved in building beaks. What are those genes, and why do I have math in church? Oh, man, I'm subjecting you to the worst kind of stuff. Well, it's got to be mathematical. It's got to have numbers or it's not real science. Uh, anyway, this, this formula is, I don't even know what it means. I'll, they'll just admit that right now. But I, I don't know what the variables mean. But I do know that this is a formula. According to what these guys, I read the paper in Nature Communications. Uh, they say this formula is what mathematicians use to describe the shape of a cone. Shape, the shape of a cone. Now, a cone can have a wide base or a narrow base. A cone can be steep or shallow in its shape. So you can adjust the shape of the cone by just tweaking some of these variables. Well, they found um, in developing embryos, they, they colored the cells with fluorescent dye and imaged the cells in a developing embryo, and they found, okay, the top graph and the top, so you see the colored, you see the four color, the three images, see the three images? Do you, do you see these three images? Like no one's yeah. even, okay. Uh, so do you see the little colors? There's like green and blue colors inside those images. I know it's, you should have sat in the front row. Uh, you'd be in danger of the spit and the smell, but you'd be able to see. I don't smell that bad. You'd be able to see. Those, these are cells that are growing, and they're building a beak in the baby bird inside the egg. Okay, And, and, and then on the right, we have two graphs. One graph shows... Um, uh, shows the shape of the cone that's, be, that's being built in the beak, and the other graph shows the shape of the cone based on the formula. So the authors concluded that somehow this formula got embedded into these cells so that they knew how to tweak and adjust the shape of the beak. The shapes of, it's basically a cone shape. And so it's not death. It's not uh, seasons. Oh, it's the seasons are there, but those are just conditions. The birds are detecting the, se the, the conditions. The birds are detecting, hey, there's not as much of a, it's not as much of a soft seed. Maybe we need to uh, tell our baby to adjust this uh, uh, variable in the formula so that baby is born with a thicker beak, so that when baby gets born, baby will be able to access the food in that next generation. And there's the formula, and it's embedded and encoded into the genetics. Somehow, we don't know exactly how, but we see an exact match. Those two plots show an exact match. Anyway, you look up the paper and you tell me what you think. Uh, okay, second to last, deer mouse. Deer mouse. It's the most common mammal in North America, maybe the world. It's all over the place. Um, Paramiscus, deer mouse. Isn't he cute? Until he nibbles on your toes, then he's freaky. Well, the deer mouse, um, uh, we find it all over the Midwest. There's a, a, main, a big population of it in Nebraska. These researchers um, are, are studying it. But from Nebraska, it's been uh, migrating eastward 
and others have been migrating westward. And as they migrate from the central plains to the east, they encounter forests. And uh, for some reason, and we still don't know why, but for some reason, uh, the tail gets longer in the, in the following generations. The tail gets longer when it goes into the forest. Well, he, well, that's cute, and maybe it's because the short-tailed ones get eaten by something, and maybe it's the death of billions of unfit that uh, make the creature change. Except that the ones who pioneered the forests in the West, Washington State, California, etc., those um, also have longer tails. And so there's an image, a, a radiograph of the prairie and the forest varieties in the, um, in the West Coast, and the same thing in the East Coast. Now, what does it take to make a longer tail? There's two basic ways you could make a tail longer. Raise your hand and give me one of them. Yes, sir. Didn't hear you. Okay, okay, let me ask the question again. I don't think I asked the right question. There's, we need to get an actual tail, not a string. Okay, so we want to get the mouse to grow a longer tail. So there's a couple basic ways to do that. Hand, another hand, yes. More bones. You can add another vertebra, and that'll lengthen the tail. Any other way? Yes, sir. Longer bones. How come you have all the answers? Because it's you're in the front row. That's it. A students are in the front row. Thank you for raising your hand. Oh, you heard this before. You're an engineer. So that's what you do. That is exactly right. Uh, well, okay. So both uh, populations in the eastern forest and in the western forest have more bones and longer bones, which requires engineering. It looks like it requires engineering to us because it's repeatable and it's appropriate in some way to its new environment. So there's, we've looked at, um, what was the first one we looked at? Distin betularia, the peppered moth. And we found that it had a transposable element, i.e. an internal switch that makes it shift from light to dark, dark to light. And then we looked at, um, what was it, the spider next? Stick spider. And we found that every time it inhabits a new Hawaiian island, it, um, it deploys a totally different uh, color, version of itself. Uh, and then we looked at, um, ooh, what was it? The, the blind cave fish. How could I forget those? They're all over. I even told, I even told Scott, put, put some aquarium in my office if we don't have lab space. But there's a dinosaur bone in my office right now, so I've got to get rid of that first. Um, anyway, so what do we see? What do we see? The, the eggs of these blind cavefish have, de have conductivity detectors on the eggs, and it uses those data. So it has detectors, just like an engineer would put on it. Uh, and then we looked at um, the, the three-spined stickleback fish, and it's got all kinds of internal detectors and appropriate responses. It responds appropriately to the ocean by producing defenses against predators. And then um, if we looked at um, the, uh, the geospita, the, the bird, and we found that it has this formula. It's internal, not because a bunch of birds died, it's because it's got this formula on the inside that I think the Lord Jesus, the creator of all things, put there. And so, hey, if we have a divine engineer, we might as well give him credit for some divine, divine engineering. And, um, and then uh, we just talked about the deer mouse, and the deer mouse keeps deploying these same repeatable um, tail options. And then we're just going to look at the variation in the bovid kind, that's the cattle kind. So there's a long horn for you, long horns. These are interfertile, okay, so you can crossbreed a um, regular old cow with a bison. By the way, let's call it a bison and stop calling it a buffalo, because the buffalo is like an African animal, it's different. Oh, is that moving? Oh, yeah, I took that footage from Oklahoma. Uh, it, it might be a beefalo. So anyway, when these cross bead breed, why are you laughing? <laughs> you saw the movie Napoleon Dynamite, and they asked him, you know, what's your favorite animal? And he goes, a liger. <laughs> it's pretty much the best animal ever. <laughs> Something like that. And everyone laughs. But they're real ligers. It's a real animal. It's a lion, tiger, crossbreed. They're the cats are all the same creative kind. They're just variations on that theme. And so we have, we have the same thing going on with, with uh, the bovids. In fact, um, uh, the Bantang in, in Asia is, is interfertile with bison, which is interfertile with a yak. 
uh, which is infertile with cows. And there's a small degree of possible infertility with even some other African uh, bovids. So uh, ruminants, you know, they have as much a stomach and they can chew a cud, okay? So, but look, longhorn, shorthorn, curled horns, lots of long hair, short hair, a hump on its back, no hump on its back, uh, but all variations, they're all interbreed, so they're all variations. It's like a Swiss army knife, these things. They just keep deploying this option or that option. And when you deploy one option and it, um, um, it produces, let's say you've got a mom and dad and they've got their set of options and they pioneer some new land and they move away from the original population, then you sort of reduce the genetic capabilities. Um, sometimes, maybe not. That's something I'm willing to test. Now, bottom line being, a lot of variation that God obviously put into the original created kind. And this leads us finally to us in this room. We have dark skin light skin, curly hair, straight hair, tall, short. But we all came from Adam and Eve. And you know what God put into Adam and Eve? Gobs of standing genetic variation. Because he knew that not only did he want us to re reproduce, multiply, and fill the world and survive in it. Oh, it's way more than just survival. He wanted us to thrive in this world. He wanted us to be good managers of this world because that's the dominion mandate and you'll have dominion over the birds of the air the fish of the sea i just saw the jurassic world movie i had to my work made me go and then they interviewed me afterwards so don't don't uh, crucify me for contributing to the machine uh, i went in the matinee if that helps any and it's you know jurassic world dominion and then this character says you know we have no dominion, which is, of course, a direct assault on Genesis 1.28, where God said, you have dominion over the birds of the, fit, the, the, birds of the fish, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, and the animals on land. And um, we do. But not only that, God loves variety. He just loves variety. He loves variation because it's cool and he likes it. So it's not just about survival. It's about showing forth his glory in engineering and design for meeting the minimum, but also in displaying options. And so we can praise the Creator today, tonight, for showing uh, all these predictions fulfilled of, a, of an engineering-based model where creatures detect their surroundings, they're doing the detecting, they're doing the processing, they're doing the appropriate responding, and they can do it again and again, and they can do it fast within sometimes six generations or fewer, sometimes zero generations, just within your lifetime. Which reminds me of... Colossians 1.16, which I can't read. Who's got it? All things were made by through him and for him. All things were made through him and for him. And I think we can give him new glory tonight for not just making a moth to be a moth, the same exact moth every generation. Moths are cool, and he gets glory for making moths. I mean, after all, they can fly and stuff. But he made moths. He made these fish. He made you and me to tweak and adjust certain features for specific reasons. Some of those biological, some of those just to glorify him and showcase his variety. And he did all this work and he gets the credit. No longer should we as Christians fall in line with the secular world that says um, natural processes did it. Natural, nature, nature, nature. It's like we're worshiping and serving the creature rather than creator. Romans chapter 1. So we as Christians ought to be leading the way in doing the best biology and showing how engineering explains how creatures adapt. And leading the way, of course, and pointing to the creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the ultimate engineer. Well, let's take a few minutes uh, of that stretch break. And during that break, I, wanna, I want to uh, invite you to peruse the book table where you can see we have more copies tonight because we got the stacks were low from this morning, so we got some more copies of Creation, Basics, and Beyond, where we have two whole chapters that describe how creatures adapt uh, and give some examples of that and all kinds of other questions. You have questions about the Ice Age. You have questions about um, someone asked me, do you have any resource on the gap theory? And I said, Creation, Basics, and Beyond. We have a chapter that refutes the gap theory. It's indefensible. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but... How does radioisotope dating work? We even have a chapter on, you know, dinosaur feathers that are featured in Jurassic World. 
I think it's bad science, and I can explain to you why from the technical literature in an easily understandable way. If every Christian college student um, or going to college ought to have that as a resource, and it's not the kind of book that you necessarily want to read from cover to cover, but if the question comes up, you'd have the resource and you'd be able to go and find that answer at your fingertips, basics and beyond. We didn't bring any copies of Replacing Darwin's Sacred Imposter with us, uh, but you can order that. We have all kinds of resources available at icr.org. But uh, definitely sign up, if you would, if you haven't done it yet, for our monthly magazine, Acts and Facts. And we, we, if you enjoyed a little bit about what you heard me try to express tonight, we have more of that in every single issue of, of Acts and Facts.